Mission is off-grid renewable energy technology design, innovation, and integration. This panel will be chaired by my colleague, uh, Dolph Gielen of the International Renewable Energy Agency. Dolph is the uh, director of the Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn. Uh, before joining, Irina Dolph was chief of the Energy Efficiency and Policy Unit at UNIDO. Uh, in that capacity, he managed a number of large projects involving energy efficiency and renewable energy. For that, he was a senior energy, senior energy analyst in the Energy Technology Policy Division of the IEA in Paris. Uh, so that's the brief on Dolph, and I will hand the chair, hand the floor over to him uh, to take over. Thank you, Dolph. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for uh, staying on for this uh, panel. Um, we've had sessions on policy, we've had sessions on business models, and we have sessions on financing. This session now uh, will focus on the uh, technology side. Uh, we will have uh, first four presentations. Then I will ask the speakers some questions and then we open up the session for questions from the floor. And we'll try to close this session by five o'clock. The um, the first two presentations will focus on the uh, state of technology. We'll hear from SMA on the current state and, and the outlook for technology. Uh, we'll hear, hear on uh, new payment systems from Bangladesh for uh, solar home systems. And then we'll focus on the economics of uh, renewable diesel uh, hybrid uh, mini grids and we'll conclude, conclude the set of presentations with an overview of what uh, IRENA is, uh, is doing in this area. My uh, panelists uh, for today, um, I'll first introduce them and then we'll move to the, to the, to the speeches. The, 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 First speaker is Willem van Butzelaar of SMA. He's the uh, sales director for, for hybrid energy solutions. He's working out of the Australia office and he covers Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific. The second speaker is Munawa Misba Moin. He's the managing director of Rahina Fru's Renewable Energy. Solar, he's responsible for uh, the solar PV and energy services uh, section. The third speaker is Sylvia Kreipiel. She is the head of Frankfurt School UNEP Collaborating Center for Climate, Sustainable Energy and Finance. And she has a, a background uh, on, on renewables in the, in the banking sector. And finally, uh, we have uh, my colleague, Emmanuel Taibi, who is our uh, lead on uh, energy transition roadmaps and, and uh, island uh, transition uh, planning, including grids. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, move to uh, our first speaker. Willem, please. All right, thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. And it's with great pleasure to be here. Um, I've been working in the uh, off-grid industry, so to speak, for the past 11 years in lots of different countries, in America, in Turkey, in Japan, in Australia, in the Pacific. So it's with great pleasure to be with all of you in one room, because I know we're all doing the right thing. Um, if you look at that picture, that's one of the systems uh, I would like to talk about. That's about two hours north of, um, of Alice Springs with a German car. It took me about 45 minutes. Um, so you see in the background, there's large diesel generators. That's how the community is being powered up there. And over time, of course, it got too expensive, too much maintenance work, so that the utility who has to power that community, that's power and water in the north of Australia, um, had to come up with alternatives. So solar systems have been installed. Um, 
Of course, it's a great idea. It reduces uh, fuel consumption and costs. But there's also challenges coming up. And that's what I want to focus a little bit on today. Before um, I go into the details of that, please let me lose a few words uh, about SMA, about ourselves. So we are around for about 33 years, manufacturing inverters. It hasn't been always solar inverters and off-grid inverters. It actually started with railway technology. So whenever today you see a train, Trans-Siberian Railway, Tokyo Subway, whenever it's got a gray box on top, it's very likely an SMA inverter. Um, by today, about 33 gigawatts of our inverters have been installed around the world and about 5,000 employees are working for our company. So based in 21 countries, one out of that is, um, one office out of that is uh, based in Sydney. And from Sydney, we are looking after Australia, but also the Pacific Islands, um, New Zealand, Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia since 2007. So one number we are very proud of is that we just cracked the one gigawatt mark in Australia. So one gigawatt of inverters in just one continent is quite a nice number. We're talking here about off-grid systems. So um, out of these systems, um, more than 3,000 um, systems are off-grid th systems in Australia running on so-called AC-coupled systems. And again, I'm talking a little bit about the technology, how these are being established. So that's a quite trivial picture here. Um, the development of fuel costs as opposed to solar systems. And it's we all know that. We all know where we are today and that there's a full business case behind that. But again, the higher the PV penetration in a system gets, um, the more challenges are coming up. So what are the solutions or the issues um, in those um, systems here? And specifically here, when we talk about a fuel saving application, we are talking about rather large systems. So if we look at that picture, and this is an example of a mine. It can be also an island. It can be a remote community um, or a remote business as such. Um, we are looking at um, industrial loads and industrial is only in terms of the size of it. It can be a whole island, which is also called an industrial load because of its size. There might be parallel diesel generators. Um, there might be also a powerhouse. So what? has to be done is a solar system needs to be added. Which again is a nice idea. We are looking at a grid and we are looking, so to speak, at a normal grid connected system. Um, including those, um, those solar systems into those grids requires a communication between the existing system of diesel generators um, and the solar systems, but also knowing what the loads are doing, right? So a whole integration um, um, communication system has to be integrated. But at the same time, one of the main worries which are coming up, usually when you start to talk to the operator of such a system, is that they say, oh, don't, don't touch my system. It's been running for 10 years. Um, don't tell my diesel generators what to do. And that's exactly what this technology is doing. It only receives information from the diesel generators and the controllers. Um, it also receives information from what we call the data acquisition module, which is getting information from the loads, and then it constantly compares those values, the load values and the generator values, in order to control the solar system. So why are we doing that? Because we can't underload the diesel generator, because it doesn't like it. It forms carbon inside, glassing effects, it would break. But we also can't overload the diesel generator. So if a solar system is running at full power and a cloud passes by, then the energy we would expect from a solar system would break down and we would hand over the whole load to the diesel generators. So everything has to be controlled. And it's not like a normal grid connected system anymore where you just pump all the energy into the grid you've got. You have to have an intelligent household in that system. So a main controller does all these um, uh, comparisons and that means that it would supply uh, information through those yellow, uh, the point, pointer doesn't work, sorry, um, from the main controller over to the solar system in terms of power output, of the height of power, but also the contribution of reactive power. Because if you've got um, uh, motors running, pumps running, then you need a different kind of power, which we call reactive power, and that needs to be supplied as well. So a whole control mechanism today is necessary for these systems. If, and that's a solution without storage, Right? So until certain PV penetrations, we say 60%, and 
And PV penetration, the definition of that is momentary power. It can't be a comparison of installed power. It has to be momentary power we're looking at. Um, if that goes up to 60%, you can install such a system. If fluctuations in the system get too high, then you have to smooth the whole behavior of, a, of the overall system. And then storage might be necessary, but only on a smaller scale. And that can be controlled then through the same controller as well. So that's a different way to show uh, how these systems are structured. On the left-hand side, you see the solar system. In the middle, you see diesel generator systems, uh, sometimes bundled with a grid connection as well. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you see the loads. And once again, it is very important that the already existing generator system is not invaded. The solar system does not tell the existing system what to do. It only listens to it and reacts to it accordingly in terms of its power output. So even more from an engineering point of view, here you see uh, four parallel diesel generators, also an integrated um, uh, public grid energy source on the left-hand side, a decentralized solar system with string inverters. But the same, same thing on the left-hand side now can also be realized with centralized inverters. So if we look into where we've made most experience in Australia and the Pacific, uh, then it's either a whole island power supply where existing supply infrastructure is, exists. So that's where we find parallel diesel generators with controllers shown in that picture. But also in mining applications, for example, where it's exactly the same requirement, but just the loads are a little bit different. We just call it different. And I usually make the comparison that in Australia we got a lot of sand in between. That's what we call it remote. In the Pacific it's a lot of water. But everything else is exactly the same. So um, business model behind it, I think that's also very important to look at. First of all, geographical um, differences. Um, lots of PV systems have been installed in Germany, for example, but this graph should show that there are irradiation differences, but also differences in costs of diesel. So in Germany, for example, we wouldn't talk about diesel power supply at all because it does, basically doesn't exist. If we look into Australia, which is the other side of things, um, there's a lot of diesel grids, same as in the Pacific um, or North Australia as well, um, and the solar radiation is much higher. So if you look into the yellow area there, um, that is where it makes sense that a uh, solar system is being integrated. And it takes a while to understand that picture. On the horizontal axis, you find the price of diesel per litre. And on the vertical axis, you find the payback time of the system you are investing in. So if the solar radiation is much higher and the diesel cost is above $1 per liter, it makes a lot of sense to add a solar system because overall this, the costs in your system and maintenance costs will be much lower. Um, of course, you have to have a look into the payback time because you're investing in a system and then there's lots of variables going into that. So that example is based on a 2 megawatt system um, with a radiation of about 1,600 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak in year. Um, the installation costs have been calculated with about 2,000 US dollars uh, per kilowatt peak, and I know that can vary a lot. So the range of installed power we've seen in terms of costs has been anywhere between $1,000 per kilowatt peak and $6,000, just depending on where it is, what it supplies, and who invests in it, and what the system looks like. So this can be only an example. Um, the fuel costs, of course, very important to know. So in that case, it's 1.3 US dollars per liter. And the generator efficiency. So how much fuel does a generator use to produce one kilowatt hour of electricity? Very, very important factor. And if we take all these factors together, in that example here, the payback time is about four to five years. And because in solar systems, we're talking about very, very low maintenance, the rest of the time of the lifetime of a solar system, which is always developed and meant to be 20 years, um, the rest of the energy is for free. Of course, there's little maintenance. You have to clean things. You have to uh, check the installation over time. But um, after four to five years, the majority of the investment is done. So looking again at uh, penetration levels, um, we say up to 20% of PV penetration so again, a system is running at, let's say, one megawatt 
there's a solar system running at 200 kilowatt, then that penetration is 20%. The spinning reserve, so there needs always to be a certain reserve in a diesel grid to cope with certain fluctuations. That spinning reserve can always cope with the passing cloud. If it gets higher than that, then you need control mechanisms. You need something which combines the work of the diesel generator with the work of the solar system, which is, can be such a controller. But again, 60% doesn't always mean that this works because fluctuations can be too high um, or there are seasonal um, um, effects like rain season, for example. If you still want to stay there at 60%, then the addition of storage might be necessary. If you want to go higher than 60%, then definitely a grid manager is necessary. So 100 plus percent. So you might ask yourself the question, why 100 plus? How can you go higher than 100%? Well, if you install like on a one megawatt system, it makes a lot of sense to install 1.6 megawatts of PV, for example, because you want to cover everything by solar and only have the diesel generators there as a backup. But then it requires on one hand storage, and on the other hand, a grid forming inverter, which is then necessary to, to provide voltage and frequency in that grid. This is a very, very complex topic. And I'm only given 15 minutes, so I'm trying to do it with German efficiency here. But it, if you look into um, those 100 plus systems, and some of you might have heard about um, the project in Tokelau, which took place two years ago. That's exactly those 100 plus. So there we are actually looking at 150% which today covers 92% of the overall energy supply with those grid forming inverters. Some examples, and I've just chosen two. Uh, one is the very first installation of that fuel safe controlling technology. That was a mine in South Africa. And they were operating two 800 kVA Perkins generators. They added a one megawatt PV system, so quite considerable penetration there, and used that uh, fuel safe controller as the combining controlling mechanism. So they're saving today 450,000 liters of diesel a year. That's quite a good number and guarantees a good payback time. That's some graphs which show uh, the operation of that system. So if you look at the upper curve, that is the, uh, the load curve of the overall system. The uh, yellow curve is the solar curve in that area and the black curve is the resulting power the diesel generators have to supply. So the area between the gray and the black curve is actually the saved energy through a solar system. Another one, the closest to here right now, which is using that fuel safe technology is in Tonga. So on the island on, of Vavau, it's a 1.8 megawatt grid where 500 kilowatt of solar have been added they are saving 225,000 of liters of diesel per year. So in other words, you can easily say that one megawatt in this region saves you almost half a million liters of diesel per year. One thing we are very proud of is that that fuel safe technology got the InterSolar Award in Munich, the biggest solar trade fair in the world, um, just three weeks ago. And with that, I would like to finish my presentation to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Will. I think that was a, a very good uh, introduction into the, the technology and, and how you can build a hybrid system. But apart from the development of technology on the, um, on the, the hybrid systems, we also have a new technology uh, related to the uh, solar uh, home systems. And uh, I would like now to invite Munawa Mishba Moin to uh, give his talk on the uh, on the prepayment systems for uh, solar solar home systems, please. Good afternoon. Uh, I think for the last two days, a lot of time, you may have heard about uh, this off-grid uh, success story in Bangladesh with the solar home systems, almost three million installed. Uh, it's a fact. I'm going to share you some of those informations and we have been fortunate enough to be part of that success story over the last 10, 12 years. Uh, but also I would like to highlight, maybe I won't be able to share too much uh, insights today, but 
There are also pilot mini grid projects taking place in Bangladesh. There are also large irrigation pumps taking place in Bangladesh. So maybe in the next uh, off-grid session, we'll share those uh, stories uh, also. Uh, every good story as we progress has its challenges, and I'm going to share with you the challenge of, uh, that we are facing in Bangladesh to move from the 3 million already installed to the 6 million that we want to do by 2015-16. Uh, so just a quick uh, run on in terms of solar renewable, what has happened uh, in Bangladesh so far. So you got 3 million homes, you got more than 200 plus solar uh, water for irrigation, which are these large 500,000 to 800,000 uh, liter pumps. And you have two, two megawatt of solar hybrid solutions in remote areas for all sort of community applications. Uh, then you have 11 megawatt peak worth of solar rooftops, uh, mostly done uh, in the urban area. And you have the solar uh, BTS, telecom systems, uh, almost 300 done and I think more to go. Uh, the country has done approximately 135 megawatt of solar PV installations. Uh, the solar home system uh, segment itself has generated more than 100,000 plus green jobs. Just to give an idea, our own company has 500 unit offices all over the country with 3,500 people every day going out there installing, servicing, and collecting money. So that's the intensity of the uh, solar home system rollout. And I'm not sure about these numbers, but they claim we, from the home system, we save like $3 million worth of carbon credit. Uh, so that's. So that's the curve, if you look at it. Uh, it started back in 2001, and uh, the rise was very steep from 2009, 10 onwards. Uh, I think uh, it's certain things coincided, I think by that time, as you all know, that the prices of the panel started dropping, and by that time, a lot of the initial roll, uh, rollout had happened. So at the moment, I think we are doing almost 70,000 homes a month. There are 47 participating uh, organizations uh, under the program. So again, uh, from the beginning, why success? You know, you hear what are the specific points? Uh, we believe one of the significant thing was the robust design of the home systems from the very beginning. Uh, from the very beginning, good quality panels, tubular lead acid batteries, lights, charge controllers, everything was done from day one. If you looked at 2000, all the global players, you name them, they were present in Bangladesh. Of course, the story started changing uh, as the volumes picked up, production started becoming local. So today, everything of the home system is made in Bangladesh, from the panel to the batteries, charge controllers, LED lights, cables, you, you name it, everything is. And just to give you an idea, a 50 watt peak system would cost uh, anywhere around 185 to $190 uh, for a system. The battery was the biggest challenge initially because we had three to four years uh, credit plan initially. Right now the average credit period is 24 to 36 months. So the program mandated that we needed a battery with at least five year uh, guarantee period, and if you all remember, back in 2000, there were not too many people in the world who were willing to give such guarantee in remote uh, rural village areas. Uh, 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 part of the battery industry out there took the challenge, and the good news today is these batteries on the field have survived more than nine years. That's the reality. Uh, the good thing was very nominal grant. The program started with a very nominal grant of 20% of system cost, and it has now gone down to 5%, and that 5% is only for system sizes 30 watt peak and below. But 30 watt peak and above, there are no grants anymore, only refinancing of five years. What we also have is by ITCOL, a very strong monitoring platform. They have a technical platform, a credit assessment platform, uh, business evaluation, so this is a continuous process every quarter that they monitor all the 47 POs, the field installation, so there's a reasonably very strong 
uh, monitoring platform which ensures that, you know, everything goes good. So what do we see? Because technology is evolving. When the, when the program started, we used FTLs. Now we have moved into LED. So uh, all those improvements uh, are coming. The, the, the issue, the technical issue that we need to innovate right now are some of the field challenges that we are facing in terms of collection and cost of collection. When we were small, it was okay, but as we are growing big uh, in terms of programs and rollouts, we figured out that these costs are no more uh, sustainable. So if you look at our uh, logistic expense out there, so you have 75% is the cost of collection. 10% is the cost of sales and marketing. And 15% is customer service training and things like that. So cost of collection is a very high part of the OPEX uh, in the program. Now this is the more interesting slide. Where is the challenge? So there is something called the overall collection efficiency and there is something called the monthly collection efficiency. The overall collection efficiency is still more than 90%. But the danger sign which is being shown is the monthly collection efficiency. If you look at the last four years, it has dropped from 57% to 44%. So these are the uh, signs which are driving us to find some sort of uh, acceptable solution which will uh, improve these trends back to the 85% level. So cumulative overdues, so overdue grows with number of installation. As the number grows, so does that. With increased number of uh, installation, as I said, the, uh, one person looks after around, 90, uh, around 120 customers. So uh, the looking after the 120 customers, the cost of frequenting them, sometimes they are there, sometimes they are not there. So all these adds to the costs. So what is the goal that we have set for this prepaid SHS system? This is a pilot phase right now. Uh, the pilot, in the pilot phase, um, there are several people out there trying to do it. We as a company, we are also doing 100 home system as a pilot. Uh, of course, reduce the risk of default, uh, establish accountability to pay, reduce cost of collection, accordingly logistic expenses, and eliminate cash handling. Imagine the amount of cash handling that takes place right now, anywhere between three, four dollars to ten dollars a month into 2.5 million customers. So we are talking millions and millions in dollars, forget about Taka, uh, every month in terms of, and this cash is being handled literally physically and then, uh, you know, sent to the nearest mobile money or bank deposits and things like that. So uh, these are the things that uh, we need to avoid as we move forward. So we have taken uh, two type of uh, technology solution to look, off, look into it. What we did was we went and we scanned out there what's happening globally in terms of prepay. What we found is that there are almost seven to eight people doing mobile pay or on-the-go pay in Africa and also in India. Uh, what we figured out after assessing those seven, eight players was that one of the, one of the feature uh, of their right now people existing in the market is that the technology is very proprietary. And one of the reasons why in Bangladesh the home system succeeded is that we never believed in proprietary technologies. So that was one hindrance why we could not bring in the existing players into this collaboration. And number two was uh, everybody has worked at our numbers which were very, very low, maybe a few thousand installations here and there. And the other thing was they also did not have requirements which we needed in Bangladesh that along with the payment system, we need to secure the uh, solar home uh, system itself, for example, so that if the panel or the battery is disconnected, can the guy still go about using the system? So we needed to uh, incorporate all that. So after looking into all the players out there, we took the decision to uh, go ahead and do it on our own. 
uh, with a European uh, partner and a local partner to develop the sort of uh, prepaid solar home system that we would need. The other thing with the existing players uh, out there in the market was the cost was too high to be incorporated uh, into the existing solar home system. Uh, right now, a charge controller in Bangladesh, 6 amp or 10 amp, would cost anywhere between 6 to 8 dollars, you know. And the question was if we bring the charge controller to the level of a prepay system, how much more dollars can we add which will make sense to us and also to the end consumer? And that scope is not too much in our assessment, anywhere between 5 to 10 dollars more. You cannot add anything more than that to make this thing effective and, uh, and good. So uh, the options right now globally available are too expensive. So the f out of the two type, the first one is a very basic uh, localite keypad based controller. As you know, mobile penetration, like a lot of the places in the world, in Bangladesh, it is one of the highest, almost 95% plus is the mobile penetration. Every solar home system owner even at the 20 watt peak level, has a mobile phone. So the idea is very simple. They use the mobile phone to make the payment. In return, they get a SMS code. They put in the code. The system runs. It's a, it's a flat charge that runs for 30 days. If you don't refill, the system uh, will uh, shut down automatically. The second one uh, is a little bit uh, more uh, up on the technology, this is the GSM based. So the system would have a SIM card built in it. Uh, we do already realize and recognize that just for payment system, uh, a GSM based uh, uh, approach may not be a feasible approach uh, because it's just going to be a bit too more expensive. But we have some other things in our mind that can be added later. So that's the reason we still kept it as part of the pilot project that uh, if this system has to go, then we have to add a little bit more value to the system to make it uh, feasible. So the, this is pretty, pretty much can do everything from system monitoring to payments, you know, and any value added service that you want to pump into the uh, homes, the user, the user of the solar home system. So these are the two, uh, two systems that we have at the moment uh, rolled out as, as I speak. Out of the 200, we have rolled out 50 of them. There are 150 more to be rolled out by end of July. So one is with microenergy in Germany, and the other one is with e-technologies in, the, as I said, in Bangladesh. So we'll, after the end of July, we'll give three months to get feedback and inputs and all, and the whole idea is to see if the commercial versions can be made available by December, January, uh, end of the year, beginning next year. Uh, apart from the outcomes that we are expecting for the home systems directly, uh, one of the relevancy that we eventually found out recently was when we were actually implementing some pilot mini grids. Uh, because uh, with this, What's, happen, what's going to happen is a large section of the rural home is going to get used to the concept of meter and prepay, which is a very important concept for the success of mini grids. So that's another relevancy that we are finding as we are making these uh, uh, pilot project uh, solar home system meter uh, prepay system, because that habit of getting into, looking into a meter and paying is significantly going to help the pilot mini grid uh, projects that are taking place uh, parallelly uh, in the country. Uh, what we assume is that it is going to be a significant breakthrough uh, once we succeed in how the whole solar home system program is rolled out and managed uh, within Bangladesh and maybe outside also. Uh, and it will uh, strengthen and complement the growth agenda that has been put into place uh, for the solar home system. Uh, yes, there will be a significant improvement in the financial management from cash management, from uh, managing outstanding dues and loans and things like that, reduce uh, default risks and of course minimize the cash handling from the individual companies to people who already are good at 
handling cash like the mobile bank people and the regular banks who have reached uh, into the, into the uh, rural uh, areas. I think that's it. Before I conclude, just a quick note on our company. We are a 26-year-old um, RE company, uh, and uh, we do pretty much everything in off-grid to on-grid area from the home systems to mini grid to irrigation pumps to centralized systems to rooftop. Uh, and uh, we have done more than 25 megawatt of installations uh, so far. And uh, we welcome everybody to visit Bangladesh and see the off-grid success phenomena. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Murawa. That was very interesting. So you see that the Innovation uh, here is is not only in the uh, in the panels and in the inverters and what we heard earlier, but also in the payment system, which is probably a, a, the, the the operation and maintenance uh, management cost of such a system is a critical component in the overall uh, cost structure. And uh, maybe we can g get a little bit more in detail as we get to the the discussion around on that. Um, I would uh, like to move to the uh, third presentation. It will be from Sylvia Kreibiel, and it will be on the uh, economics of uh, hybrid systems. Please. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for, for having me here. Um, for us, it's quite an exciting time to present the indicative results of our study. We are currently in the middle of the discussions with our stakeholders and ground. It's also the reason why we are currently here in the region to do our site visits to the sites included in our study here in the Philippines and in Indonesia. Um, as Dean Cooper is not uh, present here for the panel, I would quickly like uh, to, to frame um, our analysis. So what we have done uh, over the last nine months was the analysis of the economic viability of a hybridization of larger scale brownfield sites. So existing sites operated with diesel generators. Uh, we focused very much on the larger sites um, starting one megawatt and then um, reaching up to seven megawatts. Uh, the broader UNEP program uh, will also comprise um, smaller and in particular greenfield sites in a phase two and phase three. Um, these phases are expected to start in the, in the second half of this year. For the first phase, the research focus was clearly on the economic viability of the hybridization. So does it make sense from an economic perspective to replace a part of the diesel generation capacity with renewable energy uh, generation capacity? We focused very much on PV, um, as we haven't found so many sites with biomass and wind potential, at least not measured and, and validated uh, wind potential. Um, we focus on uh, economic viability, so we assess, um, we include societal costs of carbon in our analysis, but we also then in a second step uh, focus on investor appetite, financial viability, and the required financing structures and support mechanism. Um, what's really new in this study is that we focus on real data. So for the first time, um, we have brought together a group of stakeholders which can analyze concrete data from ground. Um, we have focused on eight sites, and we show you those sites later on. And I think it really makes some sense to add another level of concreteness to the international discussion. Um, of course, this also results um, in some additional challenges in, in gathering the data. We spent now nine months uh, for gathering the data from all the sites we wanted to um, include in our analysis. Uh, some background on the uh, project setup. The sponsors of the studies um, are Siemens, Irina, and UNEP, and we are very happy to have this public-private partnership structure already um, integrated in our project design phase, not only in the implementation. Um, my team, the Frankfurt School UNEP Center, is the implementation consultant and also sponsors part of the study. We have an uh, advisory board, and I know that some members of our advisory board are present here, so thank you all for your input you have provided so far. 
Um, as I said, we are currently in the phase of presenting the indicative results to our stakeholders. Um, we want to receive their feedback and then we'll publish a final report in September this year, so after the summer break when everybody returns relaxed from the holidays. Um, I said that we focus very much on concrete data, including all the related challenges. Um, we have found eight sites um, across the continent in Africa. We focus on a site in, in Togo, in Kenya, and one in Gambia, uh, in Asia Pacific. Um, we have the Philippines and Indonesia, and then Colombia, the Dominican Republic, and St. Vincent um, in Latin America. Um, these sites are all utility scale. You see that the size is mentioned here, the largest one in the Dominican Republic, 9.5 megawatt. The two sites here in Asia, quite in the middle, 3.7 megawatt um, is the size of the Buzuanga um, power plant here in the Philippines. And the second one, in Indonesia, also 3.65 megawatt installed capacity. Let's stick into the detail. Um, and I want to present here the, the, some key facts of the Buzuanga sites, and this is the data we have received for all sites. So first of all, you see the load curve um, here at the bottom uh, right. The blue one is the load curve, or the output of the current generators, and then you see in the green line the output of a potential PV power plant. Um, this evening peak we find in many of our sites. This is a typical residential or rural area load curve, and not comparable uh, to what we see in the SMA presentation with, these, uh, co with the commercial site and the peak during midday, which is much easier to hybridize than a residential site. Um, the site in Buzuanga is currently 3.7 megawatt of diesel installed. Um, they uh, use nearly 3 million liters of diesel per year. Um, in our analysis, we focus on the 100% peak penetration uh, technology. So in contrast to what um, the colleague from SMA has presented, uh, this technology switches off the diesel generator when the um, renewable energy resource is available. So in our site, you see that during approximately um, 9.30 and 3.30, we can switch off the generator, and we do not need the generator to stabilize the grid. Um, to reach that, we, we need to install approximately 3 megawatt of PV capacity, so comparable to what is installed in diesel right now, but of course the output in diesel is significantly lower, and this is due to the lower capacity factors. Um, with that, we hope that we can replace approximately 30% of the existing diesel generation would save us 1.2 million liters diesel per year, so approximately $1 million. Um, and over the lifetime of a project, we could achieve 63,000 tons of carbon abatement. Um, but how does it look like from the economic viability perspective? Um, and this chart, I think, explains very nicely um, w what we have calculated. The first um, column shows you the levelized cost of electricity um, in a pure diesel scenario. The diesel price uh, scenario we have used for this analysis is the EIE reference scenario. So a very, very conservative one with a decreasing diesel price in the next years and then only increasing starting 2020. Um, you see next to the diesel LCOE, the hybrid LCOE, which comes in um, slightly lower at 34.4, um, uh, um, and this is a mixture of diesel and PV. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the LCOEs for pure diesel and a pure PV plan. So assuming that I can sell every kilowatt hour produced, a PV would come in way cheaper at 17.4 compared to diesel at 36.7. Yeah. We have then weighted this output according to the um, output we want to achieve, but of course we also have to include costs for the integration. We cannot use every single kilowatt hour produced by the solar system. There is some excess electricity, as you've seen on the previous slide. 
here showing uh, midday there is sometimes the green line above the blue one. This is excess electricity which cannot be sold. Um, and of course there are some additional costs for the system integration. And this increases our um, LCOE for the hybrid solution um, then to the 34.4 um, US dollar cent per kilowatt hour. Um, I think that those PV experts amongst you might ask whether the 17.4 for PV are a bit conservative. Yes, that's most likely a conservative assumption, but we feel very, very comfortable with that. What drives the economic viability? And um, in the case of Buzuanga, um, of course, there is economic viability is given. It's cheaper. Um, the LCOEs comes in lower than in the pure diesel scenario. Um, but what drives actually this economic viability? The next chart you see um, the different sites we have analyzed so far. So we have data for, um, for six out of the eight sites. Um, the most attractive site is the one in Nusa Penida. And it's a very nice combination of scale but also high radiation. Um, everything below two megawatt becomes relatively expensive because the system integration investment is relatively high. And of course, increasing solar radiation also improves the economic viability. Um, one, um, one additional comment on financing costs. The chart on the, um, the left-hand side first um, shows you the dependence and the impact of financing costs on the levelized cost of electricity. In our base case, we have assumed um, equity financing cost of 15% and debt financing cost of 8%, which gives us an initial weighted average cost of capital of approximately 10%. This might be conservative again, but I think it's appropriate for an IPP scenario. In case of a utility finance or on balance sheet financing for such a project, the financing costs would come down. In most of the countries, the financing costs of a utility, which also benefits from some concessional financing, does not come in above 5%. And then at 5%, the economic viability is even stronger than in our base case scenario. So you see in, um, in, in Mozuanga, the break even is reached at capital cost of 10.6%. On the right hand side, you see the different uh, diesel price scenarios. So again, the, the um, scenario number three is the EIE reference scenario. The last one, which shows a way higher economic viability. This one is a 3% steady growth um, scenario. So based on the current oil price and increasing it 3% um, yearly. As I said before, I believe that the reference scenario is a very, very conservative one. So we feel extremely comfortable with those results. Um, financial LCOE and financial viability is somehow different from economic viability. So economic viability um, answers the question whether it makes sense for the economy and the utility to a shift from diesel only production to a hybrid production. The financial attractiveness for an investor very much depends on the revenues he can achieve, can achieve and it depends on the revenue level for hybrid or in um, hybrid solutions or for PV. Um, the, the existing PPAs and feed-in tariffs we see in these countries hardly address the specifics of hybrid solutions, so there need to be a bilateral negotiation um, of a PPA. Avoided cost of the diesel uh, will be uh, a good remuneration level for the hybrid system. And given that economic viability is there, um, the, the government or the utility should also have an interest to, um, to agree to such a PPA. Uh, implementation considerations, of course, it's not only about the analysis, but some key findings um, we have made so far is economic viability if given, and this is in the EIE reference scenario and assuming private sector financing terms, so assuming a little bit of concessional financing or financing made available uh, by double bottom line investors, the economic viability and the attractiveness of the projects will even improve. Currently, the majority of those sites are owned by public utilities, and 
um, the involvement of private sector finance would require way more than only the initiative from the private sector. It would require also the willingness of the utilities to sell their generation assets and to accept independent power producers. Um, we will see whether this will be the first step in the implementation or whether these utilities decide to do um, the first hybridization projects on their own balance sheet. The financial viability in some cases still needs to be created, um, but, but we are confident that this can happen based on the given economic viability. We are currently in intense dialogues and we are awaiting the feedback from our partners on Crown, but I think the indicative figures demonstrate that there is a huge opportunity for, for hybrid solutions and whether it's a low-hanging food or not, this is what we will find out when we, when we walk the talk. Um, we have started this process um, and we, we will come back hopefully next year to this conference with some concrete results on the implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia. So uh, you saw the, um, the new economic analysis of uh, hybrid uh, uh, PV diesel systems, and the data suggests that uh, under nearly all conditions, uh, such, a, such a transition makes economic sense. Now I want to move to the final uh, presentation, Emmanuel Taibi on uh, our uh, IRENA activities. Emmanuel, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I know I'm the last speaker of the pretty much last session of the event, so I see a lot of tired face in the room, and mine is one of them, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview of what are the key technology issues for off-grid integration of renewables. Uh, I'll give an arena perspective looking at what our members asked us to work on and what we are actually delivering on. So, brief outline of my presentation, I'll be setting the scene while we're discussing renewables in the context of off-grid. Uh, I'll have a very brief overview of what we're talking about when we say off-grid, and then go through some of the key technology issues we're going to be focusing on. So, grid stability, electricity storage, uh, role for standards, and some, uh, finally, some examples of some of the systems that exist out there with large penetration of renewables already operating today. So this uh, slide gives a general overview of why we are discussing renewables in the context of off-grid. In some cases, off-grid, even with some storage, is already cheaper than grid power. So there is a lot of discussion at the moment of where these low-hanging fruits are, but there is certainly an economic case for discussing these issues. So in the context of what I'm going to present on technology, the main driver is the economics, of course. So it's already something that makes sense. It makes sense without storage, it makes sense with a bit of storage, and probably in the future with the reduction of cost in storage will make sense also with more storage, which means more penetration of renewables in the same conditions. Uh, one of the famous IRENA charts on the cost for renewables, uh, the reason why I put it up there, not all of these technologies are applicable for off-grid, but you see two, uh, let's say, blue areas. The one at the bottom is the conventional grid power price. It's a range, it depends on the country, but it's a the one that usually you're discussing when you talk about grid power in a, let's say, a large scale generation from uh, fossil fuels. When you start looking at off-grid, very often the competitor is a diesel generator, and so you see the blue area at the top is a completely different game. All the renewable technologies are competitive there. Some of them might require some additional costs for integration, some of them don't. So we have six major families, but only the variable ones require some additional costs for integration. So in this context, again, we are discussing this because there is a strong economic case for it. This is the only, let's say, complicated slide that I wanted to leave in my presentation uh, to discuss a little bit more in detail what is the role of technology. So all these numbers can be discussed. Each case is different, depends on the shape of the load curve, depends on the variability of the loads. But very generally speaking, at low level of penetration, there is no cost for integration. Technologies are not... Uh, particularly complicated is a business as usual. You can connect your, let's say, three kilowatt system on your house to a large grid. There is no integration issue. There is no additional cost. When you start getting at a higher level of penetration of renewables, especially we're talking solar and wind, variable renewables, then 
there are some additional considerations to be made. The, the message here is that there are technology solutions available today. We heard about some of them today. And uh, these are already deployed in many cases. And this is the case also when we're looking at high penetration. So we have many different families of technologies. There is very technical issues that can be discussed. We're going to touch upon only one of them, the grid stability. But there's more than that, ancillary services, for instance. But the, the key message is that there are families of technologies with many different uh, manufacturers that can provide solutions today. And some of them have already been deployed, and we're going to see a few towards the end of my presentation. Uh, Another element that is important to mention, that the cost of integration is non-linear. So we looked at the chart where we have these three families, low, medium, and high penetration. Uh, similarly, this is just an illustration. It's not numbers for a real case. It's just to give an idea of what this means when you start translating it. The first part, for instance, you put PV in a diesel grid. You've seen uh, the 17 cents versus the 35 cents for diesel, so it's clearly cheaper. At a growing level, then you need some more controls. Then you need some more. Uh, a little bit of storage possibly, and then when you try to supply the last kilowatt hours, that makes it more expensive than your usual case. So it's just a matter of looking at the economics as they evolve and what technologies can help you in integrating higher shares of renewables. This is a dynamic picture. With a reduction in cost of renewables, this, this uh, curve shifts down rapidly. Just a, a quick slide to say where are we looking at in terms of opportunities. Uh, is the mini grid, for instance, a stepping stone for uh, moving to grid expansion, or it makes sense to look at mini grids as an alternative to, to grid expansion? Uh, application we've seen a few today uh, could be rural areas for rural electrification, could be mining is one of the, the, the important areas where now at the moment renewables have been deployed in off-grid. Defense application has been uh, a field that has seen a lot of technology innovation for many, many years, and telecommunication as well. Been visiting some rural areas in the Pacific where Community has no light, has no electricity, but a telecom tower has a beautiful solar system perfectly operating. So these are some of the applications that are already working today. And one of the, the key issues at the bottom, you can see hybridization of diesel system for cost reduction is one of those that is most discussed today. It's been discussed in all the sessions. We've been discussing that today. There is a, a strong economic case for this, and there are technologies that allow to do a lot in this area. I'll try to keep it very simple. This chart doesn't look simple. Uh, the reason is that the issue of grid stability is not simple. Uh, modeling the grid in general gives you an understanding of what are the, the, the possible faults you should be looking at and what is the role of renewables in actually stre strengthening or weakening the grid. The next step is what are the technology solutions that you can apply in all these different cases to, to look at how to integrate more and more renewable energy. Some of these technologies are uh, something that is already present in most of the grids. Some other technologies require minimal additional investment. Some other require actually a change of the way you look at demand. So when you look at smart grids, especially going forward, this is a big enabler for renewable. It's not just about generation technology. It's not just about the prepayment business model technologies, but it's also about the demand technologies. So if you can dispatch some loads, if you can disconnect your air conditioning, it's as good as you can have a battery storage, for instance. So a lot of these uh, strategies can be put in place. This just gives an idea of the complexity of the topic. But the key message is there are solutions that are already applied today that allow for integration of more and more renewables in existing grids. Uh, a brief slide on what ARENA is doing, for instance, in the area of grid stability. We're focusing on islands. And uh, as we've been discussed many times, off-grid areas that are not foreseen to be connected to the grid in the near future are somehow islands. So islands are the lighthouses for the transition to renewables in the area of off-grid, not only for islands, but also for rural remote areas. So the driver for the discussion from government member countries is that there is a large share of PV deployed and being deployed in islands, and there is a large pipeline of projects. So some concerns are raised about, is this going to destabilize my grid? So the importance of doing this kind of studies is to, to look at what needs to be done in terms of technology and uh, management strategies for the systems to integrate more renewables. And uh, we've been working, for instance, in capacity building with the Pacific Power Association, and at the same time developing the first case study last year. And there are several ongoing for this year, uh, mostly focusing on islands at this stage. And uh, we are also drawing some lessons from these activities to try to come up with a methodology. So when you're looking at an existing grid and you want to integrate renewables, what are the key best practices and methodological issues to do that in the best way? 
storage is another area Arena is very active on. Uh, storage is one of the important enablers uh, for renewable energy integration in existing grids and in off-grid context, of course. So in off-grid context is probably something a bit uh, earlier in terms of when you need to start looking at storage. On grids, there is a lot of concerns about the need for storage, but probably by using a set of these measures I shown in the previous slide with the arrows, you don't need to worry about storage too early. But in off-grid probably is something you want to start looking at fairly soon, depending on how much renewables you want to deploy. Uh, some very general facts, storage usually adds to the cost. Uh, we have a very generic range here. This is talking about a large share of storage. Uh, storage technologies, uh, established technologies seem to be still cheaper, but they are not showing quick reduction in prices, while new technologies are coming up quite quickly, quite promisingly, and dropping in prices very quickly. The, the other message is that for off-grid, uh, there are a few exceptional cases where pumped hydro has been deployed. There is a commissioning on one of these systems actually next week in the Canary Islands in Aliero. Uh, the good news is that where this is applicable actually is still the cheapest uh, storage option. However, moving forward, it probably more and more batteries that will take the lead role. Uh, again, this is the lithium-ion batteries curve. It's just to show that uh, lead acid is driven by the price of lead, which is a metal and as such is, uh, is subject to volatility on the market. Uh, lithium-ion shows a pretty steady decline that is coupled with a, a pretty quick growth at the moment. So the numbers are converging. It's still more expensive, but it seems to be one of the key enablers for renewables moving forward. This chart probably is a bit small to be read, but it's just to give an idea that when you increase the share of renewable, the yellow one is, uh, is wind, and there should be some solar as well. Uh, when you increase the share of renewables, a bit of storage might be necessary, but it gives the idea that when you're increasing very much the share of renewables, still the amount of storage, which is the orange color, is not that much. So one of the good messages is that storage is still expensive, but you probably need less than what you think if you have good control strategies in place. Uh, this is one of the slides just to illustrate what is available on the off-grid side in terms of technology. Uh, there is a general perception that there is not so much out there to, to make sure that off-grid is done in a proper way in terms of standards. However, there is a lot existing already. It's just a matter of picking the right standards and applying them. So there is, there is a set of standards for panels for charge controllers, for inverters, and for, even for a balance of the system and minor components. Everything is, is out there, is available, is internationally developed, so it's, it's quality standards. It's just a matter of making sure that when you do your tender processes, you, you, you put your best standards in place in the requirements. And just a few examples of what we are looking at when we talk about high penetration of renewables in the off-grid context from a technology perspective. Uh, as we mentioned before, the case of Tokelau is the first 100% renewable energy uh, driven country. We say actually it's 92% because the biodiesel is actually diesel at the moment. But if the biodiesel becomes actually biodiesel, then it's 100%. But we've been discussing earlier, actually, the demand has been increasing rapidly because now the quality of the service, the affordability of the service is there. And so actually, these kind of systems are just the start. So the importance of having the technologies that can be modular is key because the system has just been deployed and it's a 40% increase in demand already. So very established technology, solar PV, a diesel backup for 8% of the, of the load at the moment, and uh, tubular plate lead acid batteries, as you can see down there, is certainly the, the elephant in the room. It's the one that takes most of the space, takes a lot of capital, and takes a lot of logistics to deploy the batteries out there. However, this is already in place. It's happening, and it's not something that we are looking for as a technology Mirage is already happening and is already working. Uh, the case I mentioned earlier, very simple, uh, very unusual. You have the situation where you can have a lot of wind throughout the year and you just need to store it to, to balance the variability. And this can be done through, through a pump hydro storage, which as we said is the, is the cheapest at the moment. This system has been discussed for many, many years. It's gonna be commissioned next week in the Canary Islands. So we're gonna be there to, to see it actually working. It's one of the different cases from your usual PV plus battery that has been uh, put in place. And uh, again, technologies can be matched in many different ways. The result is 100% renewable can be done already today. 
and looking at the upcoming technologies uh, as one of the platforms for advanced technologies in Germany, that is this island of Pellworm. As you can see from the chart at the bottom, is interconnected, but it's mainly selling electricity, premium green electricity to the grid. Uh, generation technologies are pretty standard, but uh, variety. So when you talk about off-grid renewables, we don't talk only PV. There is wind, there is biogas, and then there are storage technologies. So there is a combination of storage technologies that could serve different services. We're not gonna get into that level of detail, but let's say the lithium ion is focusing on the short-term variability and the redox flow is trying to serve the, the night load or the, the load when the renewables are not producing. And also looking at storage at the household level. So you basically take off part of the load from the grid uh, during good part of the day. And so this is one of the technology platforms where this has already been achieved, 100% renewable for the island, and you're also testing new and upcoming technologies. And uh, last slide, it's a bit crowded. This is just to show what ARENA is doing in the area of technology at the moment for off-grid or relevant for off-grid. Uh, key areas are standards, smart grids, storage, and there's a lot coming on different uh, technology briefs. So we are looking at how technologies can be, of course, an enabler for higher shares of renewables, but also looking at technologies for themselves. And of course, activities, there's many more than those three, but I just wanted to, to show three because these are some of the key ones that we illustrated in the previous slides. Uh, grid stability analysis, so developing the studies, but also providing capacity building. Uh, solar PV installation, again, has been discussed. That one of the key issues, especially in early markets, is to make sure that the installation is done properly and so that the lifetime of the system is guaranteed. And lastly, one of the interesting uh, piece of analysis we're working on now is looking at how, in, especially in the off-grid or small island context, how the, the impact of renewables will reduce the tariff. You've seen something from Frankfurt School earlier. It is a very key question for, for policymakers. So now that we deploy renewables, what's going to happen to the tariff? And so with this one, uh, I conclude. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. And maybe, maybe to add that uh, Many of our island activities are grouped under the Global Renewable Energy Island Network, GREEN. So if you search on that, you'll, you'll find uh, a lot of that material. Um, what you explained is uh, that uh, the, uh, there is an, also an, an issue with uh, storage as we go to higher shares of, uh, of renewables. Uh, you mentioned also an, an example for, for a wind hybrid system, so while all the other uh, presentations focused on, on uh, PV, so there's also something going on. And I noticed that a lot of cameras were going up when you showed the slide on standardization, so apparently that is an area of, of interest. Um, we have uh, about uh, 10 minutes uh, left for this session. So I would like to open the floor for uh, questions and comments. Uh, just, <clears throat> pardon me, just one comment, and it's mostly around language. In the same way that we had to learn collectively that solar was not synonymous with expensive and that batteries is not synonymous with lead acid, so too I think we need to understand that renewable is no longer not synonymous with on-demand energy. We now have emerging technologies which are allowing us to create, renewal, use renewable energy to make on-demand power. And so we no longer have to think about hybridizing systems with diesel as the demand. My company, for example, we make a biomass gasifier that's on display out in the, uh, the uh, driveway out behind the building this week. Um, that operates like a diesel generator. It makes electricity when you want it, regardless of whether it's night or day. And so I think it's important as we discuss these kinds of systems that we be mindful of the way in which we're discussing them so that we understand that renewables no longer means only when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining, but it can, in fact, happen any time, day or night. Otherwise, thank you very much for the uh, very informative session. There's one in the back. Uh, 
I am Nagraj from India. Uh, one of the technologies actually we should look for is actually the low voltage DC also for the microgrid and also the rural electrification. In uh, India at present, we just started actually the LVDC forum, low voltage DC forum, and trying to see that actually how best actually the low voltage DC can be used. Already the manufacturers are available with uh, the fans and the refrigerator, air conditioner are also trying to run on the DC. There is an energy efficiency of almost about 20 to 30 percent is possible with the low voltage DC. Therefore, I think that is also one of the technologies we should look for low voltage DC also for the microgrid and also the low voltage DC in the house, low voltage DC in the offices and also the commercial buildings and also the rural electrification. We need to look into that also as one of the options. Can you comment on that in, in Bangladesh? Are you looking into DC? Uh, uh, DC in terms of the micro grid, right? That's what, yes. I think uh, we do actually have the, one of the gentlemen here from Bangladesh who is actually rolling out the DC, uh, we call it the nano grid right now. There are some few initial. So those models along with the standard large micro uh, grid of 150 kilowatt peak, so both are actually taking place uh, in Bangladesh in terms of initial pilot project. Uh, rollouts. This is uh, actually a comment on Nagaraj's low voltage DC. Now, I think what we mean by low voltage DC here is not exactly 24, 48 volts. We are talking about, you know, in the range of 300 to 500 volts. Now, one thing I'm finding it a bit difficult to understand at this stage is that, okay, I can understand that you can uh, operate say pumps, irrigation pumps, or uh, air conditioning equipment from a low voltage DC directly without going for further uh, transformation. But what about the general purpose loads? And for if you are talking about a microgrid for rural electrification, then the general purpose loads are quite significant. So how do we resolve this problem? Refrigerators, air conditioners, lighting, or oh, you mean mean machinery? I think again, I'm finding it a bit difficult to understand because we don't have any high uh, standard lighting available. So what I mean to say that yeah, technically possible, but it's not there. <laughs> um. I didn't really understand the, 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 the point of that question because in terms of from a technology point of view, you know, it's, it's all there. It's all on the table from small, very small to very large. Um, so, so what is exactly your point? What do you want to tackle? For a rural household or for rural application, you have got significant amount of lighting. Then you have a television. You have got electric fans. You've got domestic refrigerators. And unfortunately, they all operate from your standard AC system. If you have got somewhat little bit more industrial type of load, like uh, uh, air conditioning equipment, where you can bypass the AC side, or if you have got irrigation pumps, you can definitely use directly from the DC, provided you have the right uh, voltage uh, link. But we need some of that hardware or some of these standards for example, I asked this question some time back, is what is the standard for low voltage DC for rural electrification? I don't have an answer. I, I'm looking for an answer. Okay, I think I understood the point of the question, but I think I'm not the right one for that because we're an inverter manufacturer, not DC to DC converter manufacturer. So, um, but I think that is something which is more and more uh, being discussed. And, and I understand that point because you're looking at the um, distribution of DC power to DC loads on a higher level, finding the right components for that, which is today still very hard to find, uh, I guess because of two reasons. One is costs of large DC components, and the other one is standardized components. There are no standardized components for large DC powered loads. And I had a, a conversation with, uh, with a friend from Australia this morning about that. Australia is probably the only country with a relatively high level of standardized DC voltage 
in those systems with rather 120 volts. Um, but you're even look at, lo looking at higher voltages. And the higher you go, the harder it gets to get standardized or even any equipment at all. But that's, that's all I can contribute to that. Hi, um, my name is Chinatsu Fukushi from Sharp Corporation Japan. And um, first I'd like to thank um, the presenters for the wonderful presentations. And um, I'm highly interested in especially Mr. Wilhelm's um, presentation on the hybrid um, inverters uh, with combining PV with diesel power. And um, I have a very uh, specific question, if you don't mind. Um, I'd like to double check upon the the part you explained about the PV penetration. Uh, I think you explained that up to, if it's up to 20% uh, of the PV pen penetration, then maybe just a, a normal PV inverter will suffice. But when it comes to like um, up to 60%, then you, you use your fuel save controller. And um, I think you, you've, the, the phrase that you used is that up to 60%, uh, maybe you might require you might require batteries, and my question is: is do you have like a sweet point in which uh, like up the PV pen penetration up to this point doesn't require any batteries, and uh, beyond that you require batteries, or is it yeah. does it depend really on the size of the plant, the size of the diesel generators, and and so I, I believe it depends on those kind of factors, but if, uh, if you, you can uh, put light upon that, it'll be really uh, fantastic. Yeah, no, that's a very, very good question because I guess everyone in this room here who has ever been in touch with off-grid systems knows that no system is like the other, right? They have all different requirements. They have all different loads, different load profiles, and that's exactly what we have to look at. Load profiles define if you have to use storage, if you don't have to use storage. Up to 20% is actually our way to mention a very conservative number up to which we can recommend not to use anything else. In fact, I would say most of the diesel generator systems out there would be easily happy to take 30% or 35%, but we can't make that statement because some don't, right? So, and even with penetrations from 30, 40%, not even up to 60, loads can be so volatile, like, one big load, one big system, and nothing else. If that's being switched on and off, then PV penetration can be only very low. And you need storage for that to make it work with PV um, uh, systems. So, in other words, um, it's very hard to mention a sweet spot there. Because I think, and the, the, I guess one, one example to make it understandable is if you have a very, very constant load throughout 24 hours, there's no interruption, no switching, no nothing, and you can let a solar system run at 60% without any controller. Because the system doesn't see any fluctuations, and fluctuations are causing problems. So it is very diverse to, um, and, and the systems are very diverse, so it requires uh, investigating each single application to give you an answer. Maybe I can comment also on some comments we have been hearing before um, about storage in general. Um, and um, pretty much an answer to the first comment we, we heard after the presentations. Um, storage is not evil, right? Storage can be expensive, but it's nothing bad. Because what we, ex what we um, compare at the moment always is the investment costs of pure PV system or PV system with storage. But I think that's not the big picture. The big picture is what problem are, are we facing? Do we have the right tools to solve those problems? And I can tell you an example. We are discussing in Australia with utilities systems which are sitting on the fringe of a grid, right? Which have stability issues. Now they make the comparison, do we extend that grid or do we use storage with a PV system which will be locally charged? And the storage system is about a tenth of the price of the grid extension. And that's how we have to see it. If storage is necessary, it's necessary. And then we have to technically make it work. So I think we have to correct the perspectives there a little bit. One comment I did, the percentages you mentioned are all percentages of capacity, not percentages of electricity produced, right? 
No, that's, um, we are looking at momentary values. We are not looking at installed power. So not the capacity of, a, of, a, of an energy supply system, but we're looking at a load profile and at any given time of the day, we're looking at the fraction of the PV contribution. I, we're running late. I, I allowed for two more questions. There is one there and one there. Let's start on that side. I am Bernardo Pavla from the Philippines. Uh, my question is directed to Mr. Moanar. And also my appreciation for his presentation because uh, I think that model can be applied very perfectly in the Philippines. The one you, you in Bangla, Bangladesh. Because we are separated in thousands of islands here. And our regions is very high. Another question is directed to Ms. Sylvia. Um, my question to, by the way, my, my question to Mr. Munaw, Munawar is, uh, at what capacity do you have in your home system? L like the off-grid? Uh, the range is from as little as 20 watt peak in the program that we have, is 20 watt peak to 100 watt peaks. I, you mean? It can only run lighting facilities? 20, no. If you go to, of course, 18... Or individual 90, house. Uh, typically, they do lighting, TV, and uh, mobile phone charging. That's the typical load. And people at the higher range also add uh, uh, fan. Do you have a system for, like, an average household appliances, like refrigerator and air so conditioning So in Bangladesh, system? the average load is 50 watt peak. The most popular size is 50 watt peak in Bangladesh. Because I understand it's for the household facilities, it's about 3 kilowatt. No, that would be a different market segment. Okay. That would be a different market segment. Thank you very much. Another question is uh, for Sylvia. Uh, when we talk of levelized costs, I understand it's a summation of investment costs, fuel costs, and all the maintenance cost costs all over costs. a megawatt hour production. Uh, my question is, basically, it's renewable that has the lowest levelized cost in, in one year to 20 years period. But for uh, this different renewable power plant like biomass, pump storage, solar, maybe what is the cheapest or what's the lowest levelized cost? That's all so directed to Mr. Emmanuel. Thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, as I, as I shown in my presentation, in, indeed the LCOEs um, include all cost components, capital cost, financing cost, operation cost, so everything in the price uh, investor needs to receive to make sure that he can service the debt um, and then cover the operational cost and receive the equity margin. Um, in our example, the uh, LCOE for PV comes in at 17.4. Um, this is per kilowatt produced, so not per kilowatt sold, and, and that's important. So it also includes some excess electricity. Um, we, we would assume that for biomass, wind, and also river hydro, hydro pump storage is for us not a generation asset, but it's a storage asset, um, that for the other tech renewable energy technologies, the LZEs would come in lower than the PV technologies. And that's the reason why we feel very comfortable with our analysis. And the attractive of hybridization would even increase with other technologies. Uh, if I understand correctly, the question for me is just what is the cheapest renewable energy technology at the moment? Well, I had a chart with quite a few of them. And as you can probably notice, none of them was a point. They were all ranges. So it depends on a set of conditions. But I would say that the, the best answer is to go on costing.irina.org and you can find all the information that we've been producing in the area of uh, costing of renewable energy. Yeah. So um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the presentations. My question is directed to Mrs. Kreibiel. So um, you mentioned the, um, the evening uh, peak demand. So. Actually, this is something what I've observed with my institute too throughout the off-grid area that 
we have very often this load curve speaking in the evening. So the question is, why didn't you consider storage technologies within the system, so PV diesel storage system, um, to supply the, the demand in the evening and potentially reduce power generation costs by diesel and lower the overall cost? from the very beginning on that we want to focus on a peak penetration only. So during peak resource availability, we want to switch off the diesel generator. Uh, our technical layouts have been calculated in home air. So I think everybody accepts this software as one of the um, lead, yeah, one of the um, mostly used softwares for, for uh, technical layouts. We have used this one and we have also optimized the layout in home air. Yeah, so when um, adding batteries would have increased the levelized cost of electricity of the hybrid solution. This uh, concludes uh, the panel. Thank you very much for your active participation and can I have a wonderful applause for the participants. Thank you.